You know, as Brother Larry was sharing with us this passage from 1 Corinthians 11, it goes on to comment about what Jesus had told Paul when Paul said, thus, every time we take the Lord's Supper, how often? You know, the Bible doesn't define how often we're to take it. Uh, but it says, when you receive it, you remember the Lord's death until he comes. And as a result of that remembrance and that anticipation, we examine ourselves to make sure that we're in a right relationship with him, lest we take the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner. Someone said that in doing so, we look back, we look forward, and we look within. We look back to remember Jesus' death on that cross, that he went to that cross and suffered all that he went through beyond anything you and I can imagine. Suffering that went beyond the physical as he took the sin of the world upon himself. He who knew no sin was made to be sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And we think about how the sinless son of God took your sin and my sin upon himself and paid our death there on the cross. We look back and we remember. And then we look forward in anticipation. You know, there'll be a day when we'll no longer take the Lord's Supper. There'll be that day when Jesus comes back and receives us to himself. There'll be that day when he establishes his kingdom across the, the world. And there's going to be that day we won't need to take the Lord's Supper in remembrance because it'll be right there. We'll be with him. And, and so we look forward to that day of Jesus coming back. And then as we do so, we look within and examine ourselves you know, through the years as a pastor, I've had people in various places come up to me after the Lord's Supper and say, Brother Jerry, I, I didn't take the Lord's Supper today because I, I felt like I was unworthy of the Lord's Supper. I got news for you. We're all unworthy of the Lord's Supper. None of us are worthy of the body and blood of Jesus Christ. And that's not what Paul was saying. He says, lest you take it in an unworthy manner. It's an adverb. It talks about the way in which we take the Lord's Supper. We don't do it lightly. We don't do it glibly. We don't do it as just something that's tacked on to a service. We don't do it simply because it's what we do every quarter. But we do so solemnly. We do so seriously. We do so as we examine our own hearts to, to see, is there anything that needs to be straightened out with God? Is there anything in our lives that we need to come to him and ask his forgiveness? Is there anything that we need to go to someone else and ask their forgiveness? Whether it's on a horizontal or a vertical plane, that we are in a right relationship with God and man. And to remember that if we try to excuse our sin, minimize our sin, rationalize our sin, that each of us, our sin, is serious enough that only the blood of Jesus Christ is sufficient to forgive that sin. God has to be justified in forgiving us. And in doing so, he counts that only the blood of his son is sufficient payment, is sufficient propitiation for him to be able to forgive you and me. I think it was Martin Luther that said that he lived every day as if Jesus died yesterday, rose again this morning, and is coming again tomorrow. I wonder what changes would make in our lives if we did that. If, if we lived every day as if just yesterday the sounds of the hammer on the nails at the cross rang in our ears. If just yesterday the stench of Golgotha, the place of the skull, reeked through our nostrils. If just yesterday the cries, it is finished, ring in our ears. I wonder how that would change the way we live our lives. And then if just this morning the women came in from the tomb saying, the tomb is empty, Jesus is alive, Jesus is risen. Just this morning we hear that great good news that Jesus is alive again. Oh, what, what difference would that make in how we live today if we had that joy of the resurrection filling our hearts and filling our lives? And then if we anticipated that tomorrow he's going to come back, 
I wonder if that would change the passions of our lives, the things that we think are important, the things that we give our lives to. You know, so often we, we are passionate about so many different things, and they're all good things, I'm sure, but if the greatest passion of our lives is not Jesus Christ, to live in him and to proclaim him, if Jesus is not the number one passion of our lives, then I think it's worthy of us to look within and examine ourselves to see whether we really are in Christ. I, I wonder how it would change our priorities. You know, so many times we invest our time and our money and things that are really not the most important things in the world. Uh, sometimes we invest our time and our and our money in toys instead of eternal treasure. I, I wonder what changes would happen in our priorities if we were anticipating Jesus coming back tomorrow. I wonder if that changed the way we prepare our lives. Uh, uh, students, I, I hate to remind you this, but it's probably not too long before you're facing midterm exams. Oops, there's that word. You, you need to ask yourself, are you simply preparing for a test or are you preparing for a career? Because you might pass a test, you might make a good grade on a test, but if you don't see your classes and your tests and all the things that are making up your education as a part of preparing you for a career and for life, then you might memorize enough to pass that test and then go off and forget all about it. And to ask your teachers, how, how many cuts have I got left? And just do just enough to get by. Business person, are you simply preparing for a contract negotiation this week or are you preparing for a life? You see, the way we prepare things is different if we're anticipating living in such a way that honors the Lord Jesus Christ who is soon coming again. Now, that frankly is part of the problem that the early church faced. They anticipated Jesus coming right then. They looked for Jesus to return in their lifetimes. They, they weren't looking off into the distant future. They weren't thinking about centuries. They weren't thinking about decades. They believed that Jesus was going to come back during their lifetimes. Well, as time went by and persecution sprang up, it was uh, easy to get discouraged. It was easy to get down hard, and it was easy to despair. And as the disciples were scattered away from Jerusalem because of that persecution and people were losing their, their homes, they were losing their businesses, many were losing their lives. And they began to wonder, Lord, are you coming back? They wondered if, if maybe this was just a fantasy. Peter wrote about this in his first epistle, or excuse me, second. He, he wanted to remind the people. He said, listen, the Lord is not slack concerning his promises as some men count slackness. For a day with, his, with the Lord is a thousand years and a thousand years is as a day. And he goes on to tell them that, that just because the Lord has not come back yet does not mean he's not coming back. But he's giving people time to repent because he is not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance. And so he was trying to tell them to be patient to wait. And that's hard for us, isn't it? To wait. I think that probably all of us in our day as well as in theirs would do well to remember the, the words of Isaiah the prophet as he spoke in Isaiah chapter 40 verses 28 through 31. Here's what he said. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, does not become weary or tired. His understanding is inscrutable. He gives strength to the weary and to him who lacks might, he increases power. Though youths grow weary and tired and vigorous young men stumble badly, yet those who wait on the Lord will gain new strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not get tired. They shall walk and not weary. You know, I think part of our problem today is that instead of waiting on God, we want him to wait on us. Day after day, 
There are some in this room who have yet to receive Jesus Christ and God's Holy Spirit has spoken to you. He has prompted you. He has brought you under conviction for your sin and your neediness of Christ. And week after week, you've heard the gospel preached as Brother Tommy has shared so wonderfully with us these last few months. Brother Charles before that. And many preachers in your life and, and family members who prayed for you and read scripture to you and witnessed to you. And all has tried to share with you the, the wonderful gospel of Jesus and how you can be born again and how you can have your sins forgiven and how you can be reconciled with God. And day after day, Sunday after Sunday, week after week, year after year, you said, no, not yet. I'm not ready. One of these days when I do all my living, when I do everything I want to do, then I'll get saved. Then I'll give my life to Jesus. And we think that God ought to wait on us. The scripture says that his spirit will not always strive with a man. There will come a time where you say no to Jesus one time too many, and it's not a matter of God's not willingness to uh, save you. It's a matter that your heart grows so cold and so hard that it's like a rock and it does not respond to the spirit of God's prompting anymore. Is it really Something that, that you want to take a chance on to make God wait on you to save you? It, it may be that there are people who are here today and, and you're saved, you're genuinely born again. And yet God has revealed his will to you. He's spoken to you about something he wants you to do in life, in a career, in a, in a vocation, in a mystery, maybe with your family or in some other way. And, and you put him off. You put him off. You say, well, I've just got so much going on right now. He wants to spend time with you in prayer and communion. He wants to speak to you through, your, through his word. And, and yet instead of pulling out his word each day and, and saying, God, what do you want to say to me? We say, well, not now. I've got so many things to do. I'm just so busy. Too busy for God. And so we make God wait on us instead of, recognizing that the reverse is where we're supposed to be. If we want to experience this renewal of strength, if we want to experience the blessings that Isaiah is talking about here in chapter 40, then instead of us making God wait on us, we need to wait on God. We, we need to trust God that he's going to be active in our lives and working in our lives. And so I want us to take a look at this passage just for a few minutes. And there are two sides to it and two levels. The two sides are real simple, wait or don't wait. Do we wait on God or do we not wait on God? Do we anticipate his return? Do we anticipate his working in our lives? Do we anticipate something he wants to do within us this week, maybe even today, or do we not? At the same time, there are two levels. The first level is individual. Each of us as individuals need to decide if we're going to wait on God, if we're going to have that trust in him and put our lives in his hands, that whatever he wants to do with us is fine. The other level is corporate. We as a church, we need to wait upon God. You know, when, when you think about these last seven or eight months since Pastor Charles moved over to East Tennessee, uh, our pastor search committee has been working. And sometimes it's easy for a church after a few months, sometimes it's easy for us as individuals to get a little antsy, to, to get a little wondering, well, I wonder what the pastor search committee is doing. I, I, I wonder what's going on. I wonder if they found somebody yet. And sometimes with our own sense of urgency of wanting to see something happen, wanting for that permanent pastor to be here, we can even push them a little bit. We can, we can come up to them in the hallways and say, hey, what are y'all doing? Who are you talking to? What's going on? And, and instead of trusting them that God is working in their lives and working through them as a committee, we want to get our own agenda on the table. Friends, I got to tell you, when we decide not to wait on God and put forth our agenda rather than waiting on God's agenda, we're always going to be in the wrong place and getting the wrong answers and having the wrong results. I got to tell you, I am so blessed 
And we are all so blessed with a pastor search committee of godly individuals. These folks are sharp. They are smart. They are business people who are successful in their own realms. And yet they are spiritual people that walk with the Lord. And I know that you join me in just saying to them, we trust you. And in your own time, in God's own time, he's going to give you that person. He's going to grant you that direction. And it's all going to come to fruition. In the meantime, we can wait. We can be at peace. We can know that God is at work in and through that search committee. God is at work in and through that individual that he's already chosen as a pass for us. And we can wait. And the fact that we've got Brother Tommy Vincent in the pulpit during this time makes it a real easy wait. Amen? I tell you what, when, when Brother, yeah, go ahead. When Brother Charles first announced he was uh, taking the position as president of Carson Newman, I immediately, the first name that came to my mind was Dr. Tommy Vincent. I, I've known Dr. Vincent for over 30 years and uh, have seen how God is. He's a preacher's preacher. He's a, a pastor's pastor. He's the kind of guy that has the, the passion of heart, the personal humility of, of spirit, and, and the ability to bring God's word that was exactly what this church needed. And so when our committee announced that he was going to be our interim preacher, I was just so glad. It just, it's been such a blessing. I look forward every Sunday to sitting here and, and hearing him speak. It just blesses my heart. And so we ought not be in a hurry. Let our committee do their job. Leave them alone except to pray for them. And as you pray for them, as you pray for God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven, we'll see that happen. Now if we don't wait, some bad things can happen. Take a look in the verse and it says that when you don't wait, even the young men are going to grow weary. Even the vigorous young men are going to stumble. And the circumstances go from bad to worse. You know, Abraham's a good example of this. God told Abraham when Abraham was 75 years old that he would have a son and through that son he would become the father of many nations and through him all the nations of the world would be blessed. Well, 12 years or so passed and and Abraham and Sarai, who was 10 years younger than him, still hadn't had a, a child. By this time, Abraham is about 87 or so, and Sarai is 77, and they're, they're just impatient. They have believed God, but they think maybe we need to do it our way. Maybe we need to help God out a little bit. And so Sarai came to Abraham and said, you know, why don't you take my handmaiden Hagar and... and Maybe you can have a child with her, and through her I can have children. And so Abraham did. He took Hagar as a second wife, and she gave birth to Ishmael. Now, I think we all know the history that took place after that. And out of that lesson with Abraham, uh, it, it gives us three ideas of what happens when we don't wait on God. The tragedy when we don't trust God, when we try to take God's will into our hands and do it ourselves. First of all, we have long-lasting repercussions. It wasn't just the conflict between Sarai and Hagar that took place as Hagar despised her mistress because she had a child and Sarai didn't. It was not just even after Sarai had a child that, that the conflict stopped. It went on and finally Abraham had to send Hagar and the child Ishmael off into the wilderness. There's long lasting percussions that, repercussions that go far beyond that for today in our world. There are still the children of Ishmael and the children of Isaac that are at war against one another. Much of the conflict we experience, even through our own experiences with 9-11, are the direct results of Abraham not waiting on God. It has long-lasting, catastrophic, disastrous repercussions that last for generations. Thirdly, it's more waiting. You see, after 12 years or so, when Abraham got tired of waiting for God, he tried to do things his way, and the result was he had to wait some more. Whenever you and I tried to do things our way instead of God's way, God just says, all right, we'll just wait until you get ready for my plan. And so it was another 13 years before finally 
Isaac was born, the, the son of promise. Finally, at 100 years of age with Sarai at 90, uh, God worked in their lives and this miraculous birth took place and the child of promise came forth. But as a result of not waiting for God, here's another 13 years that had to pass. And so many times you and I do that. And we want to take God's will into our hands. We want to do it our way. And God just says, okay, I'll let you. Have you ever been driving down the road and maybe it's rush hour traffic and there's this guy just speeding up and he's passing everybody as he, and, he's, and he's tailgating each car and he's just sort of running in and out of traffic and he, and he passes you as fast as he can and with the, just a little bit of room between you and the next car, he jumps in there and all of a sudden he's just, he just going 90 miles an hour down the highway. Has that ever happened? You said, buddy, if you're in that big of a hurry, be my guest. And then as you round the corner up the road a little ways, he's over on the side of the road and there's a, a policeman behind him with the blue lights going and as you pass him by, you think to yourself, well, how would that work out for you? Do, you? do you think God ever does that with us? That God just gives us enough freedom to do it our way, and then when it doesn't work out, he looks down and says, hey, buddy, how's that working out for you? When we don't wait upon God, bad things happen. I, I read a facebook post this past week from a friend and he made this statement he said the only thing worse than waiting on god is not waiting on god well i agree with the second part but not the first part i agree that it's a pretty bad thing not to wait on god not to give god the time that he wants to do things in his own way in our lives but i disagree that it's a bad thing to have to wait on god for you see, if we understand the nature and character of God, then waiting on God is a blessing. It gives us a rest and a peace, realizing we don't have to do it on our own, that God is at work in that process. Think about the nature of God that's mentioned in the passage that we just read from Isaiah 40. Look at some of the words that it uses to describe the Lord. He talks about the everlasting God. That refers to his omnipresence, that he has always been, always will be. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And when you get antsy about something that's going on in your life, you're wanting some answers and you want them right now. You want God to respond to your prayers in your time rather than his. And so you're just not sure, well, God, are you really going to come through? Listen, if you've got a God that has in the past worked in your lives, you just need to go back to that time. Just to return to that moment in life when you saw God work in your life, when you saw him minister in that need and realize he ain't gone anywhere. He's the same today as he was then and he's going to be the same tomorrow as he has in the past. And you can trust him. His omnipresence is there with us. He says, I will be with you always, even to the end of the world. Then he calls him the Lord. That word Lord in the original language is a, is a four-letter word that is the covenant relationship name, the name that God gave Israel as he relayed to them in that special covenant relationship. We just shared in the Lord's Supper, and Brother Larry read about how this is a new covenant in the blood of Jesus. And we need to recognize that we can wait on God because we are in a covenant relationship with him that was sealed by the blood of Christ. Then it goes on to talk about how he is the creator of the ends of the earth. That refers to his omnipotence. He is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we could ever think or ask. And that omnipotence allows us to have peace knowing that if we put our situation, if we put our circumstances, if we put our lives into his hands, we can trust him. We can trust him with our lives. We can trust him with our church. We can trust him with our world. Listen, I know that everybody gets a little antsy with the presidential elections and all that you see. And frankly, I just change channels and watch somebody, something else when some of these uh, commercials or, 
or debates or anything else come on. I just don't need the agitation. I can trust God with it because I know that the answer for our nation is not found in the White House. It's found in God's house and unless the people of God humble themselves and repent and turn from our wicked ways until we come to the point of praying and seeking God's face, then nothing else is going to matter. The legislature can come and go. The presidents can come and go. All of those who are leaders, that's their important. We need to be involved in, in making good decisions and choosing good leaders. But ultimately, revival to our nation is going to come because of what takes place in this house rather than that house. And it's only when we come back to the Lord and recognize that he is omnipotent and he is able to bring revival to this country if we desperately want it and call out to him for it. And then the scripture talks about his understanding being inscrutable, that is unknowing. That's talking about his omniscience. Some of y'all in here remember a TV show that was on some years ago called Father Knows Best. And sometimes he didn't, sometimes he didn't. And we who are fathers want our kids to think that we know best and, and if they just do what we'd say, they'd be all right. And, and sometimes our kids say, it's not enough just to say, why should I do that? And we respond, because I said so. Now, back when I was growing up, you didn't ask a lot of questions or you heard a certain sound of leather pulling through belt loops and, and that sort of settled that issue. But our Father knows best, our Heavenly Father. Imagine the difference if would be if we wait on God as we choose a spouse, as we look for a career, as we choose a pastor, just to wait on God. He knows exactly what we need. He has the power to bring into our lives what we need, and He is going to do it in His own time. Having an all-knowing, all-powerful God guiding us. Bill Bright thinking about the characteristics of God and how that works in our lives, said this, because God is personal, you can seek fellowship with him. Because God is all-powerful, he can help you with anything. Because God is ever-present, he is always with you. Because God knows everything, you can go to him with all your questions and concerns. Because God is sovereign, he expects you to submit to his will joyfully. Because God is holy, you can devote yourself to him in purity, worship, and service. Because God is absolute truth, you can believe what he says and live accordingly. Because God is righteous, you can live by his standards. Because God is just, you can be sure he will treat you fairly. Because God is love, he unconditionally is committed to your well-being. Because God is merciful, he forgives you of your sins when you sincerely confess and repent of them. Because God is faithful, you can trust him to always keep his promises. And because God never changes, your future is secure secure, and eternal. Isaiah says, even the young men may faint and grow weary. That word grow weary means to be exhausted. Have you ever been to that point physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually? They just need to stick a fork in you, you're done. He says, even the young men can experience that, but if we wait upon the Lord, we will renew our strength. That word renew actually is a Hebrew word that means to change or exchange. We exchange our strength for his and in his omnipotence, in his strength, we can mount up with wings as eagles. We can run and not be weary. We can walk and not faint. Now, waiting is not doing nothing. Uh, you know, during this time, the last few months, our church has not been doing nothing. Our deacons have been deaking, our committees have been committing, our minister, staff ministers have been leading, and, and we saw 145 youth in the choir last Sunday. We've seen people constantly walking these aisles and, and joining the church. We've seen people saved and baptized. We've seen ministries continuing on every level. I want you to know, even as we wait on God, doesn't mean we sit around and twiddle our thumbs. God is at work and God is at work through our people and we're seeing the results of it every week as he is glorified and we are benefited. The same thing is true in our individual lives when we wait on him. He gives power to the faint. 
You might experience depression. You might experience despair. There may be times where, where you're just disconsolate. If you'll just wait on God and put your trust in him. Those who wait on the Lord, even if we have no might, he increases our strength. Will we wait on God? You see, the, the issue of waiting on God really is the essence of trust. Do we trust God? Do we trust the Almighty who loved us enough to gave his son to die on the cross for us? Do we trust God who, who created us, who saved us, who is still at work in our lives? Do we trust God with our choices and with our future? The psalmist came to understand this principle in Psalm 27, 4, when he said, wait on the Lord. Be of good courage and he will strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, upon the Lord. And so I'm going to ask you to bow your heads with me now and with our eyes closed, simply to ask, is, is there a need in your life that, that you just need to trust God with? You need to put it into his hands. Stop trying to do it yourself. Maybe that there are people here that you need to be saved. God's been waiting on you to be saved. He wants to save you. He desires to change your life. He desires to forgive you of your sins. Will you do it today? Will you stop making God wait on you? And will you say, today is going to be the day of my salvation. This is my hour of decision. In a moment, we're going to be singing a song, and I'm going to encourage you. Whether you need to repent of your sins and place your faith on Christ, receive him as your Savior and Lord, whether it's to come and join this church, whether it's to repent of sin and come back to God if you've been separated from him, if you've been putting off doing whatever it is that God's will has clearly shown you he wants to do in your life. Maybe just to come and pray. Whatever God is saying to you, would you act upon it? Would you do it? Heavenly Father is across this room. Your Holy Spirit is prompting hearts to come to you, to respond to you, to trust you. I pray, Lord, that by your spirit, you'll draw us to yourself for your glory and honor in Jesus' name. And as we stand and sing, our staff ministers are here at the front. You come. Let's stand and sing. You come. <laughs>